Good morning, my friends. Look, today we celebrate by lighting the next candle of Advent. During these four Sundays leading up to Christmas morning, we're reminded of the different virtues of our belief. It's hope, peace, love, and joy. Today, as we've lit the candle of peace, this candle of faith, let us, let's think about the peace that God gives us. Let's think about how in, in the craziness of life, all the tensions, the struggles, the pain, the anxiety, we only have to do a few things. Trust, believe, and pray. That's pretty easy. Trust, believe, pray. At least it's easy to say. It's sometimes easier said than done. Depending on the tradition that you follow, the second candle of Advent can represent either peace, faith, or both. It's funny how peace and faith oftentimes work together. When you have faith in God and all that he is doing in your life, well, that brings you peace. And when you're at peace, you're able to more easily reflect on your faith in God. It seems like one of those which came first, the chicken or the egg type things. Unfortunately for some of us, the uh, egg is rotten and the chicken has salmonella. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to have peace in a very unpeaceful world. You know, I, reading the news this past week, I saw, you know, there was a crazy guy shooting an AR-15 around the gas station right down the street from my house. He was just shooting off in random directions and then drove off. Two, two bullets hit two different cars and then two bullets hit the actual gas station. And then I read things about this, this young man in Michigan who goes in and decides to shoot up his school. And then, you know, you hear stories about his parents that are just like, they were like kind of okay with it. It's, it's mind-boggling. You know, oftentimes we pray out loud to ourselves, why, God? Why are these people like this? And we wonder, why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? Why do I have to go through this struggle? Why am I the one that's going through this trial? Why can't it be somebody else? Trust me, if, if I knew God's entire plan, which it's actually pretty easy, but if I knew why he did the things he did or why certain things happened, I would let you know. As, as I said, to, I had someone that uh, came to speak with me this past week, and I told him, I said, look, God doesn't make special appointments with pastors to explain how he's running the world. He just puts things in our individual paths. He puts people in our paths. All I'm here is to help understand what he's doing. And the Bible is always there to help us understand what he's doing. This, this peace of God is something that we, we often take for granted. I could be very honest with all of you. I, I, think, I think we've gotten to this point. Y'all realize it's been six months. I've been standing up here preaching to you for six months. It, it flew by a lot faster than I thought it would. Ken, am I going to wake up one day and I'm in my 60s? Is that how this works? <laughs> oh, look, I can be very honest with all of you. I, I genuinely consider all of you to be my friends. You know, during this time in, in mine and Melanie's life, it's not always been peaceful. The past six months have not been peaceful. Even as a pastor, I'm still learning every day to lean on God. Because a lot of times I'm hard-headed. Miss Fran, I like to do things on my own. We share that in common. We talk about that often, how, well, you know, I, well, I just wanted to be able to get over it. You know, I didn't want to bother God with it. 
Like he's sitting there going, oh, okay, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, just go pray a little bit. No. You know, I'm still learning how to go to God when there are times of struggle, trials, pain. I'm never going to stand here and pretend to be a superhuman. I'm going to be real with every person in this room and every person that might be watching this online. I am a person of worry and I'm a person of anxiety and fearfulness. I worry about things. But here's the beautiful part. It's Jesus that makes the difference in me. I can look at the world and I can bring some verses to mind. I can repeat these in my head. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good for them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. I can look at verses like Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans I have for you. Listen to that. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I can look at Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear. For I am with you. You. you notice he doesn't say I'm, I'm up on a cloud somewhere watching. No, 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 no. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. These three verses have become a, a mantra for me. It's something that I just repeat, especially Romans 8, 28. I, I speak it out loud often throughout the day. Whenever I get overwhelmed or aggravated or I go, all things work together for good, but in that love the Lord and called according to his purpose, my friends, written there in his word. In the book of Romans 8, 28, to the church, the apostle Paul did state that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord, even if I'm doing it through gritted teeth sometimes. And can you imagine how silly, because I do it out loud too, I'm not just doing my head. I'll be driving down the road and I've just gotten a phone call or I've just had a text message about something not going according to plan and I'm just going, all things work together for good. <laughs> Some days it's, it's harder to sing it than others. And I'll say this, that a lot of us in Protestant churches, we either make fun of or kind of turn a blind eye to what our brothers and sisters in the Catholic church do. And we, we kind of, I, I know, I grew up Southern Baptist, you know, there were lots of Baptists that were like, oh, them Catholics ain't even Christian. We make fun of sometimes the repetition and the ceremony, you know, and the, the incense and some of the repetition. Well, you know, they'll say, well, they say the same thing over and over. Too much ceremony and not enough soul winning. It's up, down, up, down, up, down. Here's what I can say is someone that is married into a, a very devout Catholic family. I, I've noticed this, that using scripture is something that you continually use, something that you continually think about. Even those little prayers that, Lord, there's enough in this room of Melody's family. If every time we have a big family dinner, they pray the same prayer. There's two Herchaks. Can y'all say it out loud for me? Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts which are about to receive from thy bounty in Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank y'all. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I put you on the spot. Look, whenever I first met Melody and I was hanging around with her family, and she has a big family, a big family. We go to Grandma Pearl's house and everyone's gathered around and we're getting ready to eat. And they're like, all right, y'all, hey, hey. And then Katie would whistle really loudly. We're about to pray. 
And everyone would quiet down and someone would start it. And the whole family is saying this in unison. And I'm going, the gifts receive. Amen. <laughs> and there's been a couple of times where they let me pray. And I'm like, you know, I'm doing what I want. Lord, we come to you today, you know. And they're kind of looking at me like, okay, this is going on a little long. But there's beauty in that, in using scripture and using prayers, using them as the tools that we can fight off the struggle. We can fight off the anxiety. We can fight off the trials that come in our lives by remembering what the book says. You know, one of my best friends, he sent me a book recently that basically the whole book is when something's going wrong in your life. And it's all listed, it's like if you have anxiety, then it has a scripture that you should say out loud. If you are dealing with anger, there's a scripture that you should say out loud. I mean, and it's, it's a big book. And it's got every temptation, every sin, every aggravation, every trial that you could have in that book. And it has a scripture that goes along with every one of them. It's kind of like a, a reference guide to scripture and prayer. And he sent it to me and I thought it was, it's one of the neatest things. And actually, if you want to know, it is, it is a demon fighting book. That's, that's what it's entitled. It's, it's a book that the monks, Greg, that the monks used to use. When they would come upon something in their life, they would say, demon you can get away from me in Jesus name and then they would read that scripture I think that is impressive because the scripture the word is here to support us and I say this not to get on to you but to challenge you if you're not reading your Bible do so not because Jesus is sitting there okay have you done your homework no but it's for your benefit the, strip, the scriptures give us strength and give us power. Just as the scriptures empower us today, they also gave encouragement to the people of Israel. They knew they were special because God would bring the Messiah out of this very small, humble group of people. Last week, we spoke about Mary. We spoke about her hope of becoming a new mother, how she would be the vessel in which the creator of the universe would be born. Mary not only had hope, as we talked about last week, but Mary had peace. She knew that the Lord had plans for her, and she trusted in him. She trusted in him. Upon the birth of Jesus, even the angels sang, y'all know this, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. There's a song that's called glory to God in the highest. And it's a Southern gospel song. So, you know, obviously I know it. And it's glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill to men. Heavenly angels announced his arrival in a little town called Bethlehem. I mean, and it's a, it's a get up and go. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. I'm going to read this to you this morning, Luke 2, 8 through 15. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem 
and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has told us about. Oh, I get chills. Can you imagine an angel appearing and saying, I have good news. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. And then the heavenly host appears. That is something that's so hard for us to imagine. No wonder the shepherds were terrified. We talked about it last week. Mary was terrified. You never read in the Bible where an angel shows up and they're just like, oh, hey, you're an angel? Cool. No, they're always just screaming and scared. A lot of them fall down on the ground. This was amazing. From Mary's faith and belief, we were able to see the God of all glory, the third part of this Trinity, walking and talking with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. As I said previously, look, God was no longer contained to just a certain holy ground or a certain holy place. God was with us. He chose this life of a mortal man because he was making the point I can do it all, and I'm going to do it all for you. He is worthy of praise. Somebody say amen. amen. Woo. Look, the people of Israel have been looking for the Messiah for years and years. We find several times throughout the Old Testament where Jesus is promised. Where they saw him on the horizon, they knew things eventually would be different for Israel. Look in Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet. 31 31. Jeremiah said to the people of Israel, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So before they had been under this law, right? That had been the, the covenant with Abraham to begin with, and then the law came into, uh, came into play, and then Jesus came and created a new covenant. We look further, this one is probably the one that's most quoted over and over, is Isaiah 53. It says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance was what we should desire, what, that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering. And familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah spoke these words. Don't they sound eerily similar to exactly how Jesus was treated? And even how he's treated today, he's despised and rejected. It even gets more specific here in Isaiah 53, 4. Look, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Look, when Jesus was led to the cross... Even when he stood in the court of Pontius Pilate and Pontius says, you know, I'm washing my hands of this. When he was led to Calvary to die, he didn't protest. He didn't shout, please have mercy, have mercy on me. Even when the disciples pleaded and begged him, oh, don't go to Jerusalem, Jesus, because you know they're going to kill you. The Savior knew what his mission was. And he knew it wasn't going to be easy. He knew it was going to take every bit of him. He knew that he would bear the sins 
of everyone from here to eternity. Yet he still went. It's funny, we talk about peace. Jesus was at peace with something that you and I, I mean, when you compare what he went through to what we go through in life, it just seems like a, not much. Verse eight, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Y'all look, this was, this had happened hundreds of years before Jesus even showed up on the scene. Isaiah the prophet is telling Israel, y'all have been waiting so long. You have been waiting so long for the Messiah. This is what he's gonna look like. They had been looking for a sign and the prophets had been giving, giving them direction about what the Messiah would look like, what he would do, how he would live. The promise had already been made. They only had to see it and follow it. However, when the time came, they didn't see it. They were so tied down by bureaucracy and tradition and man-made religious rules and they missed the whole point of these scriptures, of these prophecies. Jesus was here. Amen. The Messiah had been born. He was raised. But it, when it came time for him to mess up their status quo, the religious leaders decided that he was a problem. And they ultimately decided to get rid of that problem. Jesus wasn't just some nice guy that was teaching others to be kind to one another. He wasn't just a prophet that was giving teachings that would lead you to God. No. Yeshua Jesus was God. He is God. Amen. And he always will be God. Through Mary's faith, through the words of these Old Testament prophets, and through the power that God shows us every single day, Jesus is showing up. Amen. As we light these candles every Sunday, moving towards this time when we celebrate his, his birth, we got to remember he's on his way. Folks, I, I know that life is going to throw a million curveballs your way. In some instances in life, you're going to be overwhelmed. Imagine you sitting at the batter's box and instead of one pitcher, there's 15 of them and they're all throwing at once. You can only swing so many times, right? Sometimes you're going to be overwhelmed. However, we have an opportunity for peace. We have a promise in Jesus. We know he'll never leave us, never forsake us. He'll be right alongside us until our last breath. All we have to do is believe. Trust, pray, just keep on following him. As I quoted these scriptures earlier, even though it's hard to see in the middle of the battle, when you believe in him, guess what? All things work together for good. To them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Like Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Israel, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. 
And again, from the prophet Isaiah. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In a life filled with so much chaos, confusion, and craziness, we can have peace through Jesus. If you don't know the peace that I'm talking about, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, come talk to me. I can help you out. Y'all stand with me. God, we come to you this morning thankful. God, that in, in, a, in a chaotic life, that we can have peace, that you can offer us peace. Whether, God, it's through the words of a song, whether it's the, the hug of a, of a church family member, the hug of, of a loved one. God, if it's just that little moment when praying to you where you just give us that feeling of, you know what, it's going to be okay. God, as we celebrate this Christmas season, when life gets crazy, bring us peace. Bring us peace. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Love you, my friends. See you next week.